Item number SCP-915 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures All explorations of the interior of 915 must be documented, with a complete manifest of all personnel and equipment to be taken into 915. Declarations of intent to explore the interior or experiment with the computational abilities of SCP-915 must be declared one week in advance. No interior explorations can take place while the computational abilities of 915 are being tested. Also, no computation test can be initiated while exploration or maintenance is taking place within 915. All interior explorations are to be limited to a period of one hour. Longer forays require special dispensation from the lead researcher, Dr. Faldry. All explorers are to be physically linked to a high-density nylon cord which is anchored at a point outside 915. Standardized testing protocols of the specifications of 915 are to be applied to both 915 and the block of computers which are considered experimental controls. These control computers are specified as model HP Slimline. These control computers are specified as model HP Slimline S3600F. Description SCP-915 is a mechanical computation device with a highly non-Euclidean internal configuration. It was the result of experimentation involving the effect of upon SCP-914. Despite appearing entirely mechanical, 915 completely replicates the capabilities of the input device, one HP Slimline S3600F desktop computer. It appears that 915's exceptional topology makes these computational specifications possible. The current theory suggests that extensive outpocketing in space and time allows computations per second that would be associated with a mechanical device to be superseded. The exterior of 915 is a metal cube with sides of 1.3 meters in length. Plastic inserts can be found on all edges presumably as a safety measure to prevent contact with sharp metal seams. One side of the metal cube is able to be removed, allowing access into the interior of 915. Opposite this access point is an articulated metal arm leading up to 915's display. This metal arm is composed of several pistons which have the effect of precisely changing the tapestry that is the primary element of 915's display. 915's display consists of a tapestry woven in an extremely dense fashion, held inside a metal enclosure. Despite the density of the tapestry, it is still able to be manipulated by mechanical arms inside the enclosure to a high degree of precision. This precise manipulation is able to fundamentally alter the appearance of the tapestry in controlled ways. Note, due to its effects on RA-915-A, Continued research involving the knot theory at work in 915's display has been suspended. Dr. Faldry. The interior of 915 is a mass of gears and clockwork, as well as more esoteric mechanical components used in computation. A constant mechanical drone, as well as deeper sounds of grinding, can be heard within 915. These sounds all experience modulation and distortion predicted to be the result of the non-standard topology 915 possesses. 915 maintains passageways through its interior, presumably to assist in the occasional maintenance of 915. When 915 requires maintenance, it will display a summary of the required repair, as well as displaying a map leading to the site within 915 where maintenance is required. The interior of 915 experiences constant shifts, making navigation very difficult. Further, maintaining radio contact is complicated by the topology of 915, often leading to delays and weakening of transmission only a few meters from the entrance. While some success has been accomplished using physical contact, such as high-density nylon cord, instances have been recorded where the cord has been severed, embedded in portions of 915's interior, or with portions seemingly curled back upon themselves with the ends somehow fused together. The interior is often unsettling to subjects and investigators. Many cases of disorientation, nausea, and fainting have been reported within 915. 
it is indeterminate how much of these symptoms are a result of the sensory corruption due to the non-Euclidean nature of 915, and how much is the direct effect on humanity of exposure to locally non-flat spacetime. The internal configuration of 915 appears to be related to computations performed by the device, with more extensive computations requiring a larger degree of internal reorganization. The power source of 915 seems to be in falling air from the exterior environment. The source of this pressure gradient, and the ultimate disposition of the infalling gas, is indeterminate at this time. See Appendix 915A. Addenda 915A Team 915-J5 found the edge of the interior of 915. They described it as a great wall of blackness. They said it swallowed the light from their flashlights. But it seems more probable that there simply wasn't anything for the light to reflect off of. Further, the team described an eerie whistling as a wind from the interior of 915 blew out to the void. Is this a possible power source? Is the interior of 915 suspended in a large void and it derives power from the pressure gradient between our atmosphere and this vacuum? Further investigation warranted, assuming we can find the edge again, of course. Dr. Faldry. 915B Dr. Snorlison was recently lost within the interior of SCP-915 for over a month. Despite this, his body showed no signs of dehydration or malnutrition. However, other ancillary factors, such as hair growth, indicated he experienced several months of subjective time while within 915. Further investigation is warranted. However, Dr. Snorlison is being reassigned and will not be available to experimenters for comment. 915C I've decided to release some of my assistance research notes in light of recent events involving researcher number 915-C, Dr. Faldry. 915D In light of the investigation taken of the material related to research of this device, as well as further anomalous events originating in the interior of 915, research of 915 has been suspended at this time. It seems interactions with SCP-915 tend to fall into two categories. Most reject the non-Euclidean geometry that 915 displays, ending with a surface appreciation of these traits and mental equilibrium intact. However, a few cases have emerged of researchers and agents internalizing their experiences with the 915 in a way detrimental to their mental health. Further. It appears intimate knowledge of the workings of 915 may allow one so affected to induce preternatural effects in one's environment. We have taken steps to determine who is most susceptible to this damaging insight. While no concrete results have emerged, current evidence suggests that mathematicians and artists concerned with appreciation and understanding of space and shape are the most likely to internalize the experience of 915. Dr. Faldry. Excerpt of the Personal Log of Research Assistant No. 915-G SCP Involved SCP-915 September 12, 2007 The purpose of this first excursion is, well, to fix 915. Two weeks ago, 915 reported a need to replace Gasket Epsilon Druga and printed a map of a portion of its interior in addition to necessary instructions to repair 915. The first impression I got of the interior of 915 is the noise. Voices, even when the source is within two feet, seem deadened. Inflection is lost, as though the air were somehow thicker. However, the operation of 915 produces a wide menagerie of sounds. Additionally, each sound seems strangely altered. It reminds me of that clip I heard in college. Lucifer something. Annotation. I'm recalling Alvin Lucifer's I am sitting in a room. Even the deep sounds that I think might come from large hydraulic action have a distinct buzz. There is also a very high-pitched hum that fades in and out. Mercifully, it's never very loud. It does play havoc with understanding what some of the team says, though. This excursion is considered a success. We followed the map precisely, and the gasket was repaired. September 28, 2007 
Now Dr. Feldry has us entering SCP-915 to wander around. Technically, we've been mapping and cataloging portions of the interior of 915. We've used spray paint laced with a form of radioisotope to do the tagging. Feldry hopes that perhaps we can start to identify patterns in the geometry of 915. It's so relentlessly mechanical, perhaps the non-Euclidean following reciprocating cycles as well. October 1, 2007 We lost a member of the team. No one can quite explain how it happened. The team leader thinks we noticed it only a few seconds after it happened, but how can he be sure? At 13.45, when we set up the ideogram, he was there. At 13.52, number D-4605 reported that someone was missing. Her count wasn't correct. It was soon established that the missing party was number D-3354. The team leader immediately checked the nylon cord for cuts. There were none, despite the fact that number D-3354's connection point was missing. This is very speculative, but it almost seems the cord was folded back on itself in extra-dimensional space, so that the portion of the cord containing number D-3354's connection point was… guess the best way to put it would be… butted off. The team leader had us leave the interior of 915 once we established the nylon cord was intact. Surprisingly, it only took ten minutes of travel time to reach the entrance. Also, the system we put in place seemed to be subverted by 915's internal geometry. Each member of the team is equipped with transponders that constantly broadcast an IFOF tag and constantly keep track of each team member's IFF. The transponders of the team didn't stop receiving number D-3354's tag until 403. October 1, 2007 all experimentations probing the capabilities of SCP-915 have halted for the time being, so rotating teams can conduct a 24-hour search of the interior of 915. That's all we get. Though the capabilities of 915 replicate in every respect a modest Hewlett-Packard personal computer, the Overseers wish to continue the test if 915 is capable of being coaxed to more performance. November 6, 2007 well, we finally found samples of a radioisotope. It's key to number D-3354's can. The weird thing, though, is that it's not the Foundation-approved ideogram. Perhaps it's an attempt at communication on the part of number D-3354? The disturbing part is how childish the scrawl looks. It almost looks like whoever made this with finger painting. I'm at a loss to what it means. We put each person exposed to the interior of SCP-915 through extensive psychological testing, and there has been no evidence of any intelligence reduction. November 10, 2007 The fingerprints are not those of number D-3354. They are not of any Foundation employee. What? November 15, 2007 We found a child's tea set. Well we found what looks like a teapot and cups. They were made of gears. There was a table, too. It looked like it was made of pistons and hydraulic chambers within an exterior wire mesh. We found a clockwork doll nearby, about one foot in length. It looks like it has been damaged or thrown. The arm is detached and there are a few places of damaged clockworks around where it lay. There was tea in the teapot. It was warm. The conclusion is starting to seem undeniable that, somehow, the interior of 915 had been subverted by either a group or individual unaffiliated with the Foundation.